today. Um, I'm Ardo Berdart, I'm a, a senior director for uh, health and uh, healthcare industries at the World Economic Forum. Very pleased to introduce in a few words this session. Um, so about um, sanitation, uh, it's not uh, by coincidence that in most uh, uh, countries where healthcare is still at its infancy, actually ministers of health are also ministers of sanitation. If you think about uh, the magnitude of the issue globally, we're talking about 2.5 billion people on this planet that have no access to decent sanitation. 15% of the world population not having access to closed toilets. Uh, and that's a cost to the, to the society. And this is where we need to make investments there is a study from the World Toilet Organization that demonstrates very precisely that from, for every one dollar invested, there is an eight dollar return in economic output and wealth from increased sanitation programs. We are releasing today at the World Economic Forum uh, our report on the economic burden of non-communicable diseases in India. This is a report we have uh, produced with the Harvard School of uh, Health Economics. And we are demonstrating in there that during the period 2012 to 2030, India is on the path to destroy wealth in the magnitude of 4.6 trillion. NCDs need to be addressed. Sanitation is part, is one of the interventions that can have an effect. We're listing, we're listing in the report 12 other interventions. But I would like today that not only you talk about communicable diseases, but also <laughs> NCDs as you um, run the panel. And uh, Gupta, with no further ado, I would like to call them to you. You are editorial advisor from, for India today, and uh, I will let you moderate the panel. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this was a wonderful introduction. I think you did half my job, <laughs> so I, I can cut straight to the panel. Thank you all for being here on an afternoon. Uh, I have a star-studded panel, and I'm not just referring to the star on my right, <laughs> uh, who everybody knows. She's Kajol, a well-known film star. Although I have to make a personal disclosure, uh, since the age of 10, I've been in love with her mom. <laughs> I still am. Her mom was Tanuja, the great uh, actor of her times. Uh, Sanjeev Mehta is the CEO of Hindustan Levers. We have, we have two leaders of cleaning industry, cleaning and cleansing <laughs> industry. They compete in the marketplace, but the harder they compete, the better it is for us, which means they sell more cleansing uh, products. Uh, Sanjeev, who heads Hindustan Unil Unilever, uh, Adi Godrej, uh, who many of you know, uh, regular presence at World Economic Forum, uh, runs Godrej Industries. And besides the fact that uh, this is a homegrown FMCG giant, I can also tell you that in 2008, September, October, when everybody thought the world was coming to an end, after the Lehman collapse, there was only one businessman, one Indian businessman, who said that wasn't true. In fact, business was booming. He was investing more. And business was growing, and that was Adi Godrej. So I used to say that he should be appointed the national brand ambassador for wellness of some kind. Uh, so Adi, uh, thank you very much for being here. Sarath uh, Amaragama, uh, Senior Minister for Finance in Sri Lanka. Uh, he's a very experienced politician. But let me also tell you, uh, people, there are many uh, misconceptions in India, many mythologies. We now think that we are the richest country in the world, and uh, we sent uh, something to, the, uh, to Mars at 7 rupees a kilometer, as our prime minister keeps saying. And obviously, we've left everybody behind in the neighborhood. That's not quite true, uh, because I was watching the World, uh, uh, world Bank uh, ease of doing business ratings, and I found that you know, a lot of people were tweeting that India was ahead, say, of Pakistan. But on two or three very crucial indicators, Pakistan was still way ahead of India. But if you look at social indicators in the, re in the region, one country that's way ahead of all of us, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Uh, 
And that's despite the fact that Sri Lanka has had a history of really the most withering internal conflict. So just to give you an example of an idea of how bad that conflict was, because I used to cover that conflict as a war reporter for many years, and I've counted more dead bodies in Sri Lanka than in my country, although I've done a lot of that in my country as well. Uh, a population of about a crore, of which Sinhalas were about 80, about 8 million? 75 percent, yeah. No, about. About 7.5 million. It raised no. an army at one point of 600,000? No, 200,000. A bit more than that. Yeah. A bit more than that. But suffered casualties, which were almost 1% of that strength of the army, over every year for many years. Right? Uh, and all in internal conflict. So it's a country that could have had a lot of trouble with its social indicators. On the other hand, the country began investing in its social well-being very early on. So in so many years of traveling in uh, Sri Lanka, I started traveling in Sri Lanka in 1984. Uh, so it's 30 years. I have never seen any open defecation. I have never seen any of the filth that we routinely find in our country, in, in our cities and villages in any other part of the subcontinent. That's why we have Sarat Amaragama. He'll tell us what Sri Lanka did right and what the rest of us uh, did are not. Doing wrong. <laughs> uh, doing wrong. So, uh, uh, Kajal, I think uh, I'll be sort of, uh, uh, I'll get popular approval if I start with you. Uh, <laughs> no, you won't, not you're, from me. <laughs> you're, you are not the ambassador who has to make sure that more children stay alive till the age of five. Yes. I'll, give, I'll give you a little, uh, little piece of statistics. Uh, India has among the poorest ratios, numbers of children surviving till the age of five. And uh, it's a very interesting thing. I was reading The Economist, and I trust The Economist. Uh, it says that because of higher incidence of open defecation among Hindu populations, this mortality is higher among Hindu population than, than among Muslim population in India, even though Muslims are on an average much poorer than Hindus. So you are teaching children to wash hands. Yeah. You are teaching children to keep sanitation. Definitely. So they survive, they, they pass this landmark. I'm teaching not only five. children, I'm hoping to teach the parents as well to <laughs> wash their hands. I feel that um, we feel, uh, we feel as a team, as uh, this program Help a Child Reach Five, basically, we hope that by teaching children, we are, be, we are able to teach the parents as well, and the entire family, and uh, everybody around them. I think kids have this way of, um, you know, telling people around them about how something is very, very important to them, and making them understand it in their own simple way. That, oh, you know, this is really important. And they'll go up to their mom and say, mom, you have to wash your hands before lunch, and you have to wash your hands after, uh, um, you know, after going to the loo or whatever. And that, that's really important. And our teacher taught to us in school, and, you know, they were able to give this entire essay. And fortunately, they're children, so people just have to sit and listen to them. You can't even be impatient and say, just shut up over there. So, uh, so yeah, we've decided to use those little angels to do half our work for us. Um, also, as, um, as you pointed out, the mortality rate uh, worldwide is really, really big, and especially in our country. is It's 30% of the child mortality is in India. So I think, and mortality, because the main two reasons are diarrhea and pneumonia, which sound, uh, you, you know, which sound so silly. You know, it's, it's not some big... Um, it's not some big uh, vaccine. We don't have a vaccine for it. Or it's not some natural calamity that we're talking about. And it's, it's completely preventable, which is, which is what is so sad, really. So I'm hoping that if we can teach somebody the most, uh, why am I talking about it over here? Because it's the most cost-effective method <laughs> of, uh, uh, you know, of any hygiene program, really. That's the first step of any hygiene program that you want to put into place. So, so, so what, what kind of attitudes? does this campaign run into? We run into a lot of attitude, actually. We run into the attitude that, oh, you know, what's so important about it? It's silly. It's, it's stupid. It's small. I mean, here we're talking about, uh, you know, you're not, you're not helping us in any major way. Uh, I mean, what's the difference? And you're not going to see the difference. You're not going to turn around tomorrow. You're not going to wash your hands today and say, oh, I'm well tomorrow. It's not going to happen like that. It's, it's a behavior change that has to be, um, that has to be inculcated in entire section of society, not a section, but all sections of society, really. And that behavioral change will lead 
to further prevention of all these communicable diseases that we were talking about, really. <coughs> Sanjeev, you were mentioning to me uh, just a while back that uh, things were really drastically bad, say, in England at a particular time. Uh, maybe three centuries ago, two centuries ago. It's when, late 19th when, uh, century. Uh, one in two children died before the age of five. Yep. And, and mostly, it was mostly connected to sanitation. Absolutely. And uh, that was really going back to the genesis of Unilever as a corporation. When uh, founding fathers set up the corporation in an era, Victorian England, when one in ch two child would not cross the age of five. And it was all related to the issues of hygiene and sanitation. And that is where the first branded soap Life Boy came into being. <laughs> And uh, that is exactly where we come into play, Shekhar, in a country like India. Uh, as a consumer marketing company, what we are good at is changing uh, behaviors of people. And uh, what is most critical in uh, this hygiene sanitation space, one is advocacy linked to changing consumer behavior. And that's where we come in because we are good at that. We understand consumers. We understand the barriers. We understand the triggers. Yeah, we get to understand the attitude of people. And the third uh, important bit is, uh, the second important bit is uh, innovations. We focus on innovations, bringing out products, bringing out business systems, which help in alleviating this problem. And the third most important thing we do is uh, bring in the science of management into doing an activity with the hard matrices of business together with the partners which make a difference. So Adi, this is a, this is a business where uh, we are actually increasing your turnover and a public campaign synergizes quite nicely. Yes, that's an advantage. Uh, but uh, what I would like to say is I think our prime minister has taken a tremendous step by announcing this project of Swachha Bharat, Clean India, as I think taking this project forward will have tremendous advantages. And I'd like to point out some of the non-obvious advantages also. First of all, uh, uh, clearly we have seen cleanliness will reduce diseases, improve health, add a lot of value. But I would say that we should also put a lot of emphasis because some of the demonstrations of this project have been clean the place, sweep the place, of course, very good. But preventing dirt is something we should inculcate instead of only cleaning up dirt. I think it will add tremendously to better health and better health will lead to lower costs in the economy, not just in saving of healthcare costs, but saving of people being off work, time taken off work because of uh, bad health, and uh, it'll help the better productivity as a result. And I think it'll add tremendously to economic growth generally, beyond just the simple obvious fact of better health. Now, I think we discussed earlier also, and you mentioned it, uh, this mindset in India of not using toilets in the house. In fact, some very affluent households 50, 60 years ago in India had toilets in outhouses. Although they could very well afford attached toilets, it, it was considered dirty. It's generally the feeling is having a toilet close to the home is not healthy. And in fact, I think we'll have to train people that defecating in the open is not good. Just providing toilets may not be enough. We'll have to train people. We'll have to train, and as, as Kajal rightly put it, if you can train the children, I think they may even teach uh, the parents. And I think another major advantage will be if, if toilets are provided, uh, it will help girls attend school much better. We know that a lot of girls don't attend school as a lack, because of the lack of toilets. It will help increase the involvement of women in the economy. And BCG recently did a study, Boston Consulting Group, which says that if we can involve women fully in the economy, it will add a percentage point to our GDP growth. So I see benefits of this campaign 
much beyond the very obvious benefits and it will add tremendously to our economy. Because a lot of it is just about behavior, for example, public spitting. Yes, absolutely. It is not just defecation. Absolutely. Public absolutely. spitting, pan chewing and spraying yeah, all over yeah, the place. Yeah. And of course, we've had this tradition where we keep our homes very clean, inside our homes, our bodies clean, but not the outside, not, not the surroundings. And, and unfortunately, you know, preferably and throw, your, change that. throw the filth from your house in front of the neighbor's yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the neighbor's vegetarian and you are not, particularly throw the bon <laughs> bones in front of his yeah. house. Uh, Sarath, <coughs> what is it that Sri Lanka did right that the rest of us missed out on? Well, I want to say that uh, Sri Lanka has done very well when it comes to social indicators. Yes. You know, there are the Millennium Development Goals that all heads of state agreed to and were supposed to achieve by 2015. Now, uh, if you take uh, infant mortality, or maternal health, or life expectancy, Sri Lanka has uh, statistics which uh, match the statistics of developed countries, of America and the US. Uh, how did we achieve that? Firstly, because of the political will. From even before independence, a large amount of public spending, public expenditure, was committed to uh, particularly rural health. Uh, rural hospitals were set up, midwives were appointed to every school, and a uh, lot of uh, special feeding uh, of expectant mothers and also the children in their first few years. It was a very good package. I think if you read Amartya Sen on his analysis of the social welfare measures undertaken in Sri Lanka. He's very complimentary about that. So that has had a very big uh, impact, uh, firstly because of gender equality. Sri Lanka has absolute uh, gender equality when it comes to education, uh, when it comes to public employment and so on. Uh, we have that uh, envious record. So there are three aspects. One is political commitment and and, uh, and expenditure, public expenditure in this field. And also, it is really, in my opinion, part of the uh, poverty reduction program. You cannot think of uh, sanitation, or much better sanitation, unless you link it with the anti-poverty programs that countries come into. So you have to uh, make your society a richer society. Three aspects come in, what is normally called CAP, approach, that is knowledge, attitude, practice. You can't convert people into practice overnight. First, the requisite knowledge must be transferred. Why should you do this? What is rational about it? And how do you give all those other material incentives, factors that reinforce that knowledge? Then, of course, the most difficult thing is to change attitudes. Simple knowledge is not going to change attitudes. There are so many I mean, there are so many psych social psychological studies on this. I don't have to spend time on that. But it's, it's <laughs> doable. You have to change attitudes. And practice really comes <laughs> out of the interplay between knowledge and attitudinal change. So in terms of attitudes, what was the most difficult thing to change? Well, I would think one problem in Sri Lanka was the, uh, the demographic transition. transition from uh, absolutely rural values to urban values. And the educational system, I would uh, very much emphasize uh, a widespread educational system uh, because uh, all these social indicators come largely out of people who have better knowledge. Now, take for example, uh, when you have gender equality, the women are more aware of their responsibilities and also the consequences. Now, Sri Lanka has not only uh, good indicators in this social field, but also when it comes to population growth. We have the lowest uh, population growth figures in the region because uh, educated women tend to postpone marriage. Uh, they look for employment. So the, what is called the at-risk age, basically between, let's say, 18 to 28. You bear children basically during that time. So in Sri Lanka, the phenomenon has been to postpone the at-risk age by later marriage, age 27, 28, and so on. So that has led to a smaller population. 
So I would say political commitment, determination to uh, do away with poverty. I think that's one of the lessons we can learn from your experiments now uh, in India. And also very, very much bringing women into the decision-making process. I think those are some of the elements. I think gender equality in Sri Lanka is something you, you see the moment you land in Colombo and come out of the airport because there are those, there are those export processing zones to the left. Yes. And at any point of time, some shift is ending and some is beginning. And you see these bus loads of young women walking in and walking out uh, to go back home. So a lot of women go out to... Uh, yeah. There is a, it's a problem, really, which all of Asia uh, suffers from, in the sense that in, in terms of demography, in another 20, 30 years, there will be a shrinkage of the working population. Not so much in India, but in the smaller countries. So unless the women uh, come into the workforce, that their knowledge, their skills, their aptitudes are brought into play, then it's like, you know, going for a cricket match only with your second 11. You know, you have to have your, all the people. In Sri Lanka now, because we are talking cricket and there's that so sounds, much of it. It sounds like the West Indies team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, in Sri Lanka, we had the problem. Earlier, it was only a few urban big schools that... Right. Uh, sent their cricketers and we used to get a terrible hiding. But w once we started getting players from rural areas, you know, very, very, um, shall I say, far, far away schools, and they started playing cricket, we had a world-beating team. We won the World Cup. I, I, I was eyewitness in Colombo, I may say, uh, reg regrettably, when you beat us for the first time in a <laughs> <laughs> But you know, all, almost all boys in that team, all those kids in that team yeah, very good. were from rural schools. Yes, very good. In fact, Sri Lanka's athletic standards are very good also. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, levers, uh, Adi, pardon me if I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> since, since our childhood, and I think our parents and everybody has seen levers sell its, its premium, premier brands for, as something meant for hygiene. Life boy. Life boy hai jahan tandrusti hai wahan. So you linked your sort of flagship brand to health and hygiene. And there was always a kind of feeling that Lifebuoy is antiseptic, that doctors used it a lot, dentists used it a lot. So how did you latch on to it? And how come if you did, it has worked commercially, it has not, you haven't seen attitudes change as much as we should have? Sure. It's, uh, you know, if I step back and look at the ethos of Unilever, we have a sustainable living plan where globally we are looking at doubling the business. And uh, what we are saying is we'll decouple with the environment footprint and recouple with the societal impact. So it is not for us a CSR or a cause-related marketing. It is the very way we do our business. It is integral to us doing our business. So, it is, uh, so that's the approach we take. Yeah, is uh, if we just look at uh, the magnitude of the problem in India, is the London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. <coughs> they did a research and they found out that India loses about $30 billion because of uh, diarrhea and diseases, the respiratory diseases, and millions of mandates. And just $30 billion is 1.5% of GDP, so to say. And they also came out with that while the penetration of soap in India is ubiquitous, near universal, in rural India, is uh, washing hands after toilet in many parts of the country is as low as 1%, even mm -hmm. much lower than sub-Saharan Africa. Now, that's again going back to the core, the behavior and attitude. Many of our people feel so you, that you, you clean use, hands... You use soap to beautify yourself. You use it for bathing, but after toilet you don't, because many of the people do feel that a visible clean hand is clean. It is free of germs. And only when we take our interventions and show them under ultraviolet, then they realize that indeed it is still germs and you got to, after toilet, clean your hands with soap. So it is a problem which is much deeper in the last few years. We have through our interventions and Kajol has been a great ambassador. We have reached about 60 million people. Yeah, children in schools is... Uh, uh, women close to birth, childbirth, yes. so that we can reduce the neonatal deaths and diseases, as well as, in many cases, to the elders in the villages, is changing the habits. 
And again, like we as consumer marketers know to create categories. Yeah, we are market makers. So the way we go about it is the levers of change is make it understood, make it easy, uh, make it rewarding, make it desirable. If I give you another insight, there would be no mother who would not like to be called a good mom. Yeah? And more so, they would like the community there, the relatives, to call them as a good mom. And when she understands that washing hands with soap is going to help the child, yeah, is prevent infectious diseases, then she does take action. And at the end of the day, you have to make it a habit. Unless it becomes a habit, yeah, it won't happen. So it's not about affordability, it's not about the reach of soap. The core question on hand washing is changing human behavior. Adi, you, you also sell your products as sort of sanitation and health uh, instruments. Uh, what's your experience in changing attitudes? I think uh, uh, some attitudes are changing quite well. So India is the largest producer of soap in the world. We consume more soap than any country, more than China, for example. Bathing is a very regular habit in India. I think partly because of the heat of the country. So there's right. much more bathing in summer, and some, many Indians bathe twice a day. Whereas, as mentioned, hand washing on the right occasions is not a, a habit, and we need to inculcate that habit. And just washing with even ordinary soap kills a fair part of the germs for a short while. And there are special ingredients, which we call germicidal soaps, which can kill germs for a much longer period of time after use. And regular washing of hands, particularly after visiting the toilet, is rather important. Now, this is something we need to inculcate much more. There, is, there have been attempts. Unfortunately, it's been slow for various reasons. But uh, uh, aside from just <laughs> soap and hand washing, I feel just general improvement in cleanliness in the surroundings is very important because the lack of cleanliness in our surroundings creates a lot of disease and difficulties. I yes. Think, I think also, I, I also think that has to do with taking responsibility, really. As, as uh, Mr. Modi, I, I think that's uh, Swachh Bharat campaign. I think one of the underlying reasons for it also is for each and every Indian to stand up and take responsibility for his, his own country, really. We're all standing up together. When we say Swachh Bharat and we say that we want to do something for it, we're all standing up together and saying that, yes, we own this country and we are willing to stand up and take responsibility for it. And I think that's the behavior change that uh, is slowly... That, can add a lot that of value. we are, yes, you are adding value to it and yeah, we want to get forward with that, with yeah, that absolutely. really. Yeah, I like this uh, new Hath Saaf Karenge jingle. It's quite catchy. <laughs> I mean, forget the mixed up metaphor. Hath Saaf Karenge in the Hindi heartland means something else. <laughs> Hath ki safai. <laughs> Hath ki safai, bilkul. Hath ki safai, bilkul. Hum Hath Saaf Karenge, right? Uh, maybe we are teaching Both our chil ch children wrong, val wrong values. But uh, <coughs> how do you take the message forward? Why, why does India need Kajal to take this message forward? Because they know me. <laughs> no, um, I think um, I, I've, uh, you know, every, uh, like, what do we contribute really? I'm just a famous face, really. And uh, when I think about it, there's nothing much that, uh, you know, I, can, I cannot go and sit and teach 100 children over there how to wash their hands every day and do all that. But what I can do is I can stand up in front of, uh, you know, all of you people and in front of the media. And uh, because somewhere down the line you recognize me, somewhere down the line uh, you know me from before, you look at me a little differently and maybe accept what I have to say and uh, remember what I have to say and communicate it a little better. That's, that's really my job. That's what I think I can do. And the message will be much more watched. <laughs> <laughs> so, have, TRPs. <laughs> TRPs. Have you run into any surprises while doing this? Uh, well, uh, the, it wasn't really a surprise, but I think the, one of the biggest obstacles that we had um, 
when we started Help a Child Reach 5 was just to make people understand how important it was. Because, uh, you know, when I first went in for a conference and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm standing and I'm uh, talking about hand washing and they'd be like, really? You're talking about hand washing? Here we are, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, put, providing education. Here we're talking about cancer and we're talking about HIV, etc., etc. And here you're talking about hand washing. I mean, how exactly are you going to change the world with that? So I, I think that was one of the biggest obstacles that we faced, that yes, it's important. It is, it is very, very important when you think about any hygiene program in the world that you want to put into place. The first basic and most cost-effective step to it is hand washing. You have to start. If, you're, uh, if, you talk to any, if you look at any health professional in the world, when he enters the hospital, the first thing he heads for is the hand sanitizer. When he exits the hospital, the first thing he heads for is the hand sanitizer. So you, we are speaking about cleanliness. And if you talk about, if he's doing it, if you know that the doctor is doing it and he's healthy, he's got to help us somewhere. So, so Adi, uh, uh, it's a slightly irrelevant question, but are hand sanitizers safe? Or is it a downside to having them on your hands? No, no, they're very uh, safe. You don't have to rinse them? Not at all. They don't Not leave a residue all. that gets, it gets into your food when you eat no. it? No. 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 Well, I suppose, I don't know. I don't know if they've been tested on... If people have used we'll it just before they the <laughs> eat food with their hands. But even if you look at the contents of a hand sanitizer, it's not likely to affect. I think they, have, have they been tested? Are they safe? Absolutely. I can certainly tell you if you use a Life Boy, absolutely. No, safe. that's a soap. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a soap. I, I mean, I mean okay. I'm talking that hand sanitizer. That was perfect sanitizer. sanitizing. <laughs> no, currently popular hand sanitizers that people carry in their pockets. Yeah, so you are. don't have to Indeed. rinse your hands Indeed. afterwards. Absolutely. So you, you, don't do, you actually don't need to rinse. Yeah. Sarah, did you use uh, celebrities like Kajal? Uh, Not like her. We don't have so many celebrities. We have like many her. celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have. And one, we of you, one of whom we've imported <laughs> in India. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now she's quite, uh, you know. She's quite a celebrity. Brand yes. ambassador. Jacqueline for Fernandez. Yeah. Yes. But what I think what all this comes to is the notion of culture. That there, there needs to be uh, change in many of our cultural attitudes, because we are coming from a traditional culture which has it, had its own value system. Some of it is very good, some of it is not so very good. So it's very important, I think, that through education. Now take this whole question of uh, washing hands and bacteria. How few people know why you should do that? How does this bacteria operate? How does it uh, spread? All that is a part of our knowledge system. I mean, just telling a person, wash your hands, because it seems a nice thing to do, may be adopted. But really, if they get to know why this is done, the whole system of uh, how infections uh, spread, spread, that has to be uh, brought into the consciousness of people. Yeah. Then only they, they dedicate themselves to that practice. So I think now, uh, Mr. Godrich mentioned, there are sort of deep cultural structures, like, for example, how do you view your body? How do you view uh, the outside world? And it, it has been written that in many Asian countries, many Asian civilizations, they are very particular about your own body. You know, keeping it clean, body fluids, all that stuff is very, very... And, you know, the traditional system where people would take a little pot and go into the paddy fields and so on. That was there. But... Uh, that type of uh, knowledge, why that happens. Why, that is, after all, it's modern knowledge. How bacteria uh, spreads, how all these uh, viral diseases are spread. So there is a whole element of, I think, explanation that needs to be done. Actually, uh, importance of awareness and attitudinal change can't be uh, yeah. overstated because that's one of the reasons our, our rivers are so dirty, because our untreated sewage is being shoved into our rivers. And uh, that's one of the reasons our temples are so dirty. Uh, Kajal, yeah. aren't our temples, besides temples in the south, yeah. uh, are not really the finest example of, I mean, you... Uh, no, I'm, I, agree, I'm, I agree completely. But again, we come Kashi back... The Kashi temple in, uh, yeah. in Kathmandu, the uh, yeah. Kashi Vishwanath temple in Varanasi. Yeah. Yeah. Even Nasik, for that matter. Uh -huh. yeah. You have, but that's something, uh, that's something again we come back to, you know, we come back to pe changing, uh, you know, that's something, pool pe nikal ke pe rakto. 
so it's something that's uh, that's something that our people have been doing so constantly i mean even the pandits who sit over there eventually turn around and take that tokri and put it outside only they don't uh, they don't have a dustbin over there they don't have uh, you know anything over there udhar rakh to and where everybody sees one big pile of garbage acha theek hai uske upar hi dalna uske side pe mat rakhna is is taraf mat rakhna us taraf mat rakhna go and put it on top of that pile only so i think uh, that's something again you know you have to start where um, i would say i would say the best thing would be to educate the pandits really i mean to make it a religious to make it actually religiously wrong it, rather than morally wrong and ethically wrong that would be the first step to make it just religiously wrong to uh, you know spread dirt or in any way uh, put it somewhere where it's not supposed to be that film satyajit ray's film called ganeshatru right have you seen that that's no, about a doctor hmm. you know the this uh, He's the only conflict goli in this crowd. yeah half so, uh, this is about a doctor who talks to the temple about this and mm. then they also don't follow that then there is some uh, big plague and they blame the doctor for it you know so that's yeah. it's the same story i think it's a adoption of ibsen's enemy yeah. of the people yeah it's a beautiful film so exactly what you said that even in these religious premises they are more concerned about the self yeah. you know cleanliness purity about the self but on the public space and uh, accumulation of dirt and so on they are not so particular yeah but that's a religious places are a good place to begin this campaign yes. isn't it uh, to spread awareness yeah of course religious places one the other is school i think it's yeah. very important to catch them young and in many cases we have seen the attitude and behavior of the adults being influenced by the kids and if you are able to inculcate the right ab- habits when the kids are young and it stays with them for rest of the life and kids are open to listening hmm. you know they are open to listening tomorrow if you go except to their parents <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah as long as teachers are telling them it's fine but i think even if you go and explain to a pandit or if you ask him also you know what is the reason for this half of them don't know the answers to what you want to say also or I, if you tell them that theek hai ek kachre ka dabba to rakh dijiye wahan pe ya jo bhi hai nahi hamare iske khilaf hai uske khilaf hai jo bhi it's against this it's against that or whatever so i think that's something that they kids are open kids are in easier medium for us to put our message through and they're able to say what they want to say with that innocent as they say out of a child's mouth is out of a babe's mouth basically what's the most interesting thing you've heard from a child what's even, the most even if yours on, why on, 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 on. <laughs> the most eternal question why after everything is explained to them they're like but why i don't want to that's like but i just explained it to you this is the bacteria this is what's going to happen to you this is and they was like i don't want to and i'm like okay i i can't fight that you know i really can't fight that i don't want to i i can't fight that statement really are are you happy with the kind of communication that's being put out right now these jingles on uh, tv radio yeah, I, i think clearly the awareness is, is it effective or you think I, it could be better i know well the it, uh, anything can be better but the, i think it's very good and i think the campaign itself is a great idea i think it's going to add tremendous value and i i hope we have more such campaigns i know we have another one on in terms of women safety and yeah. uh, etc but these campaigns can add tremendously besides just economic reform and i think this is a great one and i think it's motivating the country i think it's getting people together it's getting people aligned there's there's no opposition to such ideas and uh, so i everybody I, thinks it's a good idea uh, everybody yeah, thinks it's exactly. a good idea and i think it's a it's a very very good move it's just a surprise somebody has take, taken so long figuring it out yeah absolutely the top leader yeah. in india yeah. Yeah. what's what's nice about it is that uh, yes there is as you say there is a direct economic link or whatever but what's nice about it is that actually when you think about it i mean as from completely layman's term you don't see the economic link you just think that it's for the good of the society mm-hmm. which is what is so nice to see rather than concentrating on only oh you know this business will grow or that business will grow it's just nice to see that something that's being done for the good of society by society uh i think we'll soon throw it open to questions from the audience but before i do that can i have a microphone taken to sadguru i have to ask him a trick question the sad <laughs> it's unfair to call him a man of religion he's a man of spirituality but he's a very wise man and uh when you have doubts about something you check out with him so sadguru here is my trick question the six keep their gurdwaras clean 
<coughs> Muslims keep their mosques clean. Christians keep their churches clean. We Hindus don't keep most of our temples clean. Some are clean, Tirupati is very clean. Could it be because we leave it to a particular caste or we don't see, most of us don't see it as our responsibility? Whereas other communities are able to get the entire community involved in action. If you go to the Golden Temple in Amritsar, where I often go, you find almost all devotees come in, uh, contribute to keeping the place clean. I think uh, that's mainly because uh, it's not a certain level of commitment of an individual person which is giving him access to manage the temple. It is a certain right that is coming because he becomes, belongs to a certain family. Uh, many of the temples are dominated by families who have been priests for uh, maybe a thousand years. <laughs> and uh, this filth in the temples is, uh, I feel, essentially uh, a Northern Indian fe feature, not so much in South India, really. Yes, that's true. So questions from the audience? Uh, Her first and then. Um, this is Akriti. I'm a global shaper, an initiative by World Economic Forum. So my question is that the main point of discussion was behavior problems of the Indian society. Means if you keep a sanitizer, they won't use it. If you keep a dustbin, still they, they might throw the filth outside. You have a, you know, public toilets, but they might not use it. So there's an interesting concept being used abroad known as nudging you bring certain small changes like there was a nudge brought that a dustbin, if you throw a gar garbage in it, it will make an interesting noise like it is going deep down the hole. So people out of curiosity start filling it up with the garbage like uh, whatever comes, they tend to drop it. Or uh, if there was an interesting thing done by Pune Hub that if you go to use the public toilet, at the end of the year, credits will be given and you'll get a t-shirt, something like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> This interesting concept uh, can be implemented in India without, you know, involving crores of money, millions of money. So why is this concept not so much known in India till now, uh, while other countries have set up committees on nudging theories? Who are you addressing it to? Uh, I'll address it to, sir, you make sanitizer to and ma'am, because you are uh, de dedicating about behavior Both insights. these sirs make sanitizer and they, comp <laughs> they compete viciously Anyone in the marketplace. Anyone who is comfortable with this question <laughs> Yeah, is, you know, just a few minutes back, I alluded to how we do the behavior change. And uh, first is you have to make it understood. They need to understand, like I said, that a clean, visible hands is not necessarily free of germs. So once you do that, I think the penny drops. Then you have to make it easy for them. You have to make the soap accessible for them, which thankful in India it is. Then you have to make it desirable, like I gave you the story of that mum. When she comes to know that if she washes her hands with soap and then her child will be protected, that's a big incentive, that's a big motivator. Yeah? And then you have to make it rewarding for her. When she understands that uh, hygiene and sanitation has linkages to economic prosperity, there are very clear indicators that in rural India, about 9,000 to 10,000 rupees per household is lost because of lack of hygiene and sanitation, ill health coming out of that. Yeah? And then when you reinforce the messages, then it becomes a habit. Yeah? Nudging also, what you allude to, is very similar to making it a habit. And that's what we do. Did Different levers we bring in to change the behavior. Did you use a nudging strategy in Sri Lanka? No, we use nudging for other things. <laughs> but, uh, no, there are a whole variety of uh, things possible, whole variety of uh, approaches. This is probably one. But the, the decision maker has to select out of a whole series of uh, possibilities. This may be one. In other cultures, in other societies, they may think of other strategies, which are, but the main thing is to make it effective. I think this campaign has just started and I think communication, ideas, etc. will evolve. So there will be a lot of people who will find successful ideas, whether it is for commercial purposes, whether it's for uh, uh, projecting oneself. So I think that will come. The great thing is this campaign has started. 
and I think uh, a year or two from now, I think we'll see a lot of results of it. And clearly, in, in most societies, when people see results of something coming, then it is encouraged even further. And I think having Kajol and many other people like her there is an example of the same nudging, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you? so we're basically nudging <laughs> you. <laughs> nudging star. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you something. It's interesting to talk about nudging. There's a Twitter handle called Weird Facts. I mean, why did I watch this? Don't ask me. Uh, I just picked up something that floated in Twitter space. It is a picture of a dispenser in Istanbul where if you put your used plastic bottles and plastic recyclable, re recyclable waste, from the other end, free food falls for stray dogs. So at any point of time, there are dogs hanging around this place, and people, <laughs> who, people who want to look after stray dogs come and put their garbage, and these dogs queue up and uh, eat. Yeah. So no, this, is, this is an example of, uh, of, of uh, wow. nudging yeah. as well. Of course, if we did that in India, there'll be an outcry. <laughs> but, <laughs> so we'll have to find some other uh, variation. Right. And then... Uh, Hi, my name is Sharanya Sekram. I'm from the Colombo Hub, uh, part of the Global Shapers Movement. Um, it was an interesting concept that I'm glad Akriti brought in uh, behavioral changes because that's what we were discussing for a good portion of yesterday. I find it very interesting, Mr. Amnukamad, that um, as you well know in Sri Lanka, when, when the government initiated the uh, clean Colombo and Colombo became so clean, there was an outcry of people going, finally the government did something. And there's always this responsibility which lies with the government. Nobody, I mean, Colombo is by far the most affluent city in Sri Lanka, most educated people. And yet we were just as bad almost at one point as you know, Chennai or Bangalore or wherever you want to call it. And now we, we said finally the government decided to do something. And at the same time, you have private sector and civil society doing separate things. Now, seeing as the theme of this summit is public sector, private sector cooperation, I'm actually interested to hear from, you know, especially the private sector and public sector members of the panel, whether there is a way that private sector and public sector can use you know, their joint powers to not just place the sole responsibility on the government. Because like you said, sir, it, sanitation and health is a, very much an individual responsibility. So how do we combine these two um, large sectors which stand both to lose and benefit from bad sanitation or bad health care or you know, bad cleanliness? How do they join hands and join forces to create that individual responsibility? Because really that's where it lies. You want me to? It's the only public sector person. <laughs> well, really, uh, if you look at that, the garbage, let's take the garbage collection in Colombo. It's done by the private sector. It's done by Abans. The only difference is that the, now the government has insisted that they stick to their contractual obligations. You know, in many of these urban, uh, large trade unions, uh, workforces, and so on, they, they get used to goofing off. They don't do what they are really supposed to do. So if the government insists on really uh, their own contractual agreements, as we did in Colombo, got them to really honor the agreements that they have entered into, then there's a world of a difference. So real, this is something, the, the real success of why Colombo became a very clean city is not that we invested much more money or brought more people or anything like that. There was a little bit of that. But the main reason was that those who had signed contracts, all private sector people, to perform various services were compelled or were urged to really stick to what they should do. And that has made a world of a difference. Colombo today is a very, very beautiful city. Also, Colombo, I think awareness makes a big difference because, you know, you have a promenade in, in Colombo which has scores of fast food carts, yeah. which are constantly frying uh, seafood and stuff, yeah. and there are picnickers. But you never find a piece of garbage, uh, okay. refuse. And, and th there is no cop walking around with a whistle, saying, why are you doing this? Don't, thro don't throw it here. So it's also a question of uh, awareness. Mr. Bajaj? I wouldn't say that we are adopted, but we are working in 100 villages. And our experience was, we started making toilets. That time, government was giving some subsidy also, which they reduced, so the program became a little dampened. But we made toilets. Nobody was using it. They did not want that stupid four-by-four four cubicle with a 
foul smell there compared to the beautiful environment <laughs> of uh, healthy air coming by. It was very difficult to explain that. Now, what changed is, and this addresses your point also, Kajal, peer pressure. Dekha dekhi. <clears throat> when the next village we made toilets, and they started using it, the other village which was not using it started using it also. Yeah. <clears throat> same thing happens. The same Indians, why do we throw garbage on garbages? Because already dirty, hai toh, I don't feel guilty of throwing my garbage there. Mm -hmm. Singapore, you don't see garbage, you don't throw garbage. The same Indian who would not mind throwing garbage in India does not mind, will not throw garbage. This, I believe, is peer pressure. Dekha dekhi. I believe that is the answer. If the kids around, those kids yeah. who said, no, we will still do it, if they had seen their eight, 10 friends do the right All thing, do they would. Yes. That's the point exactly. I was making. Our other problem is, you know, we have desilted uh, uh, nahers so that people, uh, villages which were tanker dependent became, uh, had 24 by 7 flowing water. Now people defecate there. In, in, in the canals? Uh, in the canals. Next to the canal, they wash, you know, wash the hands there, yeah. etc. Which is very unhygienic. Now I believe that we have not solved the problem yet, but I believe peer pressure is going to solve this problem. So I just wanted to connect with you and convey that perhaps peer pressure, dekha dekhi, could solve the problem with you. I think peer pressure and pride, because you know, look, look at our metro, how clean do we keep our metro? Even Calcutta, which got the metro so many years ago, keeps it very clean, because yeah. I think, you th one, you take pride in it, yeah. and second, you see no one else littering, so you don't litter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sadhguru wants the mic for him. Uh, when we talk about nudging, uh, we have to recognize that uh, there is no one India here. There are many layers of India which need different types of nudging <laughs> in different uh, spaces because uh, there is no one culture, one economic strata. There are so many layers, it has to be nudged accordingly. We've been working in the rural space and wherever we have worked, uh, people have most willing to change. It's just that nobody told them. It's not that they do not know, it's just that in India nothing changes by policy. It has to become an emotional movement, only then things happen in this country. And it's uh, truly fantastic that for the first time at the very top, somebody is talking about it. And uh, people went about describing this as the uh, Prime Minister is uh, wasting time on pedestrian issues. Well, ninety percent of Indians are pedestrians, so pedestrian issue is a national issue, you know. <laughs> And uh, there is a whole lot of technology in the world today. I know uh, people and I have visited these units, uh, you know, about 10% uh, of uh, Los Angeles, uh, whatever garbage that it produces, someone that I know is converting it into diesel. Uh, it's like this, there are many technologies. Unless we bring this forth, that filth can become wealth. If we just bring, bring forth this idea, private sector will be very eager to get in and people will be eager to get in, you will not be able to find filth because it's valuable. Yeah. I think we must make filth into wealth, that's the most important step we need to take. Can okay. I make a comment? Sure. Yes. I think one of the good things is that this uh, declaration by the Prime Minister and everybody following is also being accompanied by a new policy in India which mandates that companies spend on corporate social responsibility. And I know a lot of companies after this have decided to use a significant part of the CSR budgets for both this uh, spreading toilet and cleaning up. So I think coincidentally that will help the whole uh, program. Because there's a, you know, it's a, it's a very important gap because you find increasingly now people use bottled water. Uh, middle class, lower middle class families yeah. also use bottled water. But the same consciousness is not, is not there of washing the glasses properly. So I think the water is safe, whereas doctors mm. would tell you that you get hepatitis not from water but from the glass. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Because that's where germs sit. Uh, you have a question? Thank you very much. I think we're all riffing off of each other. I want to pick up on something that you said and something that you had said also, Mr. Bajaj. And that really is we haven't talked enough about infrastructure. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about behavior change. 
But one of the things that I get so tired of hearing, you know, in India, around the world, is that this is a country that has more mobile phones than toilets. So we have to use the genius of our people to disruptively move into that space of infrastructure so that we have toilets, and especially toilets for women and girls. So one of the brilliant things that the Prime Minister has done is actually to listen to what village women have been saying for decades. When they're asked, what are your priorities? The health of my children, running water, and I need a toilet. They understand. But by the time it gets filtered up to the male decision makers, with no offense to present company, it becomes completely distorted. And so let's get back to the basics and let's have many, many innovation challenges to get our entrepreneurial young people in particular providing some of the solutions for toilets. Does anybody want to respond to this? No, she's uh, absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's no getting away from it. And uh, it, it is not about either or, it's about and. Yeah, we clearly heard that if you have toilets but behavior change don't happen, it won't be effective. Yeah. At the same time, if you work just on behavior, but you don't have the infrastructure, how are they going to make use of the new habits they've inculcated? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have to work. And the other important bit is, it is again not just the job of the government. It is the government, the private sector, the NGOs, the civil society. We have to come in a cohesive way and start making a difference. But the wonderful bit is, now that it's become the center of dialogue, the center of policy, I think things will make happen. Question in the back there. Sandeep Parekh. Uh, uh, just a quick, uh, very quick comment. Um, and this is from Atul Gawande's book called Checklist. And he starts the book uh, with an example of surgeons in the US. We are not talking about uh, illiterate people uh, in the hinterlands of India, but surgeons in the US uh, don't actually wash their hands before a surgery. And uh, once he introduced this checklist, the post-surgical infection levels fell by 40%, not 5%, 6%, 40%. So I think uh, there's a lot of learning for all of us, not just for uh, the illiterates. Any more? Both of them. Are you from, from Pakistan too? Uh, she is from Pakistan. And, and you? I'm from Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Um, I'm from Afghanistan. My name is Shakira Zia, shaper of Kabul Hub, uh, community of World Economic Forum. Uh, I'm happy uh, seeing you alive in real for the first time, Kajal. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah. uh, I have a small comment, and maybe um, especially you could share your idea or maybe suggestion with me. Uh, Afghanistan is a country which maybe most of you know. It's, we passed some war, an interior war, and then uh, all the, the, the world was in Afghanistan fighting each other. <laughs> uh, we are also facing the same problem, but we do not have the problem with washing the hand because uh, mostly Muslim, Muslim community have uh, praying and they're taking ablution five times, so they wash their hands. The problem in Afghanistan or the major pro problem is the garbage problem. So every disease is again gone uh, from the garbage. We are doing all the campaign. We don't have famous actresses and actors like you to bring it to media to campaign, but the one we have, we use them. But it's not effective. Uh, if, uh, the people, whatever, uh, even the president uh, is involved in the campaign, but uh, the effects are only 5% or less than that. Uh, so if there is, if, if do you think that there would be any other way, so maybe we could use that? Uh, um. Can I just uh, make a point that Sanjeev made? I think even Adi made that earlier. But I think the whole point to conveying information is to make it interesting, is to make it profitable, and is to make it uh, applicable to whoever, whosoever you are conveying that information to. So uh, wh when you're talking about people, when you're talking about general, as we spoke about behavior change or whatever, but when we're speaking about people, we have to be able to convey that information to them in a way that interests them, that they understand and appreciate, and are able to put into practice in an easy and not too difficult manner. I think that's, but that's again something that your creative team, whoever your, uh, whoever your people are, at that point of time at, in that level will have to develop for your people because every country is different as uh, Sadhuji said that uh, you know there are lots of layers and each layer has to be tackled differently. Just, just one point, I think in Afghanistan 
you will have less of a problem in this because of uh, you being a temperate country compared to most of India being tropical most of the year. So because of your altitude and your latitude, uh, you'll have less problems with uh, lack of cleanliness affecting health. That doesn't mean that if you, don't, if you do clean up, you'll also have great advantages. But I think temperate countries tend to have fewer problems of, uh, uh, of this sort than tropical countries like India. And, 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 and don't worry, even if you don't have <laughs> film stars like Kajol, you have a cricket team coming up with stars now. I think you, didn't you beat the Pakistanis the other day? <laughs> Once in a while you do that. <laughs> so your neighbor from Pakistan. Hi, I'm Anusha. I'm from Lahore, Pakistan, and I'm a global shaper. Uh, I've worked with an NGO that focuses on hand-washing campaigns in schools. So when we were working for them and researching on nudges, as you call them, uh, I noticed a trend in advertisements. Uh, they've actually started um, focusing less on the benefits of cleanliness and more towards the medical costs that the parents have to incur if their child falls sick. So uh, I just need to know if that's intentional and if, if, if that's more effective. Are you addressing okay. it to someone? Uh, anybody, Are you addressing it? Anybody. <laughs> Uh, Sanjeev, why don't you take that? See, again, I think one has to understand the context over there. If, for instance, is uh, the illnesses are all pervasive and the cost of treating them are very high and every household spends huge amount of money, then that could be a very telling campaign. So one has to understand the context before one can comment whether that communication is effective or not. But tell us also, uh, how is Pakistan, uh, it, is there much buzz in Pakistan about this campaign in India? We do, we do have a global hand washing day and we, we follow the same advertisements as well. Uh -huh. uh, I hope the message is not the same, hard saaf <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Hi, my name is Narendra and I'm in communications and I spend a lot of time <laughs> nudging people to like brands. Um, as we sort of embark on this massive social engineering profit, uh, this project, um, and Shekhar and the minister, this question is primarily for the two of you. What are the checks and balances that we need? When are we, when does social engineering get out of hand? And what's the possible backlash that we've got to be ready for if social engineering, these sorts of projects don't work in the short to medium term? You are a public figure. You have to deal with people all the time. <laughs> no. You have to look at the, the benefits first. I mean, let's not uh, jump the gun and worry at this stage what will be the backlash, what will be the other problems and so on, because if we are so uh, skeptical, then nothing gets done. This is, a, this is one of those areas where there's hardly any uh, contrary uh, or where, where other interested groups challenge that. This is, I think, quite universally applicable. After all, uh, child health, uh, maternal health, uh, longevity, these are all universally desirable objectives. So whatever campaigns you have, there may be uh, problems regarding the content and so on, but basically the objectives are, I think, universally accepted. It goes across cultures, it goes across uh, countries. Because uh, in the civilized world, and not only in the civilized world, even in, in the past, where they didn't have the, the technology and the knowledge to combat those, still these objectives were very desirable. So I don't think this is one area where we are going to have large controversies as to, uh, you know, what are the byproducts, what are the other sidelines, side effects, and so on. But let's get on with the job. And, and I think the community or the country or the leadership or whatever you call it are, are smart enough to deal with whatever side effects that arise from things like this. I think socially the only thing I'll worry about is uh, if a kind of attitude gets drummed in that, oh, I'm clean but so-and-so is dirty. My family is clean but so-and-so's family is dirty. Then my community is clean but the other community is dirty. And you know, by God's grace, in our diverse society, we have stereotypes about everybody else, and uh, 
<laughs> so so I think I think that that is the only worry. But I think the way the campaign is being done right now is quite uh, safe. Uh, Hi, Gary White. I'm CEO and co-founder of Water.org, and we could just as easily be called Sanitation.org because we focus on both. Uh, two things. First, around kind of the the attitudes and how do you reach audiences with these messages. Uh, Matt Damon's the other co-founder of Water.org, and we we found that uh, using humor in this uh, has tremendous impact. So when Matt would do a video about how important sanitation is, like stating the facts, we'd get like maybe a few thousand hits on our website. And then we did this toilet strike campaign where Matt went on a toilet strike to kind of draw attention to this. Uh, and we were able to package in messages, you know, for people in the position to help uh, with this issue, able to package in the serious messages with the humor, and we got six million hits on the website. So I think there's, there's ways to kind of do this creatively. I don't know how you extract or extrapolate from that into the audiences of trying to change behavior locally. The other thing is with respect to the infrastructure uh, question, the, the, the concept of raising awareness, raising demand, total sanitation programs, et cetera, is, is obviously very important. But if people don't have the access to the finance in order to be able to build the toilet that they want, that's a huge gap as well. And so certainly there are the government subsidies there at the national and state level and elsewhere between that 10 and 12,000 rupee range. But there's a lot of people who want to get access to sanitation and a place to bathe and want to kind of upgrade from that. And I think you find that if people have these aspirational needs around sanitation, when they get the toilet that they want, they tend to use that and it's more sustainable as opposed to getting just the basic toilet. And so. There's a need to introduce microfinance into this as well so people can get access to the funds so that they can satisfy those aspirational needs once the awareness is raised. And we've been working with the PepsiCo Foundation and IKEA and Caterpillar and others to invest about $7 million in kind of jump-starting this microfinance market. And that's now leveraged about $60 million in uh, commercial capital that's allowed about 1.5 million people in India to get access to water and sanitation through loans as opposed to just straight subsidy. So I think we need to look at the private sector. We need to look at how do we bridge this gap between what the government subsidy is and what the aspirations are, because that can ultimately lead to, to greater sustainability. May I say that uh, what you said is perfectly correct. You can raise aspirations of people. You can change attitudes. But if the infrastructure is not there, right. and if the product is not there, then that is one of those uh, side effects, I think, which could lead to a lot of frustration. So th both the attitudinal change and the physical infrastructure must uh, coincide, coincide, must work together. The paper doll must be available. Yes. Otherwise, we go through this uh, process of changing minds, changing attitudes, and then creating a lot of frustration. This is very well known in advertising, that you must uh, create attitudes, but then the product must be there. The price must be right, the packaging must be right. You know, all, there's a whole series of things which make the package available and in an attractive way. That's very important. Otherwise, you're working at cross purposes. The one thing we now know, uh, one more example, one more evidence if we need it, that nobody is a more complete package than a politician in a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so he's even an expert in advertising. <laughs> This uh, hand washing obsession, I'm calling it ha obsession with hand washing because you can sell your soaps. <laughs> I think we should go beyond that. It's also sanitation, it's a safe drinking water, it's a, it's a how do you store the water, but we don't advertise because it doesn't sell the soaps. So I think we should get out of this narrow uh, ad advertisement which will bring you profits and business and have a much wider uh, aspects of it. And also the same uh, people may be selling uh, advertisement uh, for me, nutrition, clean food is also very important. Uh, advertisement of Pepsi-Cola and all of that junk food, uh, when nutrition is a major problem, 60% of our children are malnourished, stunted. So we need uh, nutritious food. So drinking milk, of course, you also do that. Drinking milk is more important, is an important advertisement for us. So those things are also very important than these this commercial markets with a narrow outlook is not that good. I think it has its own vested interests and they should be broader and bring in Swachh Bharat from a broader holistic campaign and go beyond their limited uh, selling of their products. That's a good point. Adi, you want to? Can I comment on that? Sure. Yeah. 
is, uh, you, you know, you spoke about a couple of things. One is water. And uh, just picking up from uh, water issue, recognizing that not having a safe drinking water in India is a big issue. We did a lot of research and came up with a patented technology that even in places where you don't have electricity, you don't have running water, you can still have bacteria-free water. And that is the genesis of Purit. And today we have about 60 million Indians having access to safe drinking water. So it is not that. Even talking about uh, toilets, our Domex Toilet Academy is doing exactly what the gentleman over here said with Ecotir. We have set up business models which are microfinancing, setting up, and running of toilets. Yeah? The whole focus here was soaps. That's the reason we were talking about soaps. We have two but minutes that's left. not where our mission is all about. And we, yeah? One questioner has been waiting very patiently. Adi, you want to come in on this? Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, you've been very, very patient. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got these lights in my eyes so sometimes. <laughs> hi, hi. Yes, hi. Just very quickly, um, I don't know if anyone has spoken about this before, but I wanted to give you a quick perspective from the U.S. where people of my generation from the 70s went through a very effective brainwashing process about um, the importance of cleanliness and not polluting, as I discovered when Prime Minister Modi launched the Swatch Bharat campaign and I saw him sweeping up, suddenly the words in my head popped in, give a hoot, don't pollute. Now what is this? This is a campaign that ran in the US for 20 years, bombarding children of the ages of like three to 10 with messages about the importance of not littering and the fact of how effective it was can be seen not only in the fact that I feel guilty every minute that I think of tossing something out the car window, but the fact that it popped in my mind when watching Modi launch this slogan. So what I want to say is in any effort at behavior change and um, messaging, I think it's important to realize that it's a very long process and any campaign that's going to be effective in the long run has to run long. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think we have to now call it a day. I think we can carry on a couple more hours? No. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think you've been a wonderful audience and wonderful panel. So applause for all of you. And uh, you've all been patient and very, uh, very keenly involved. Thank you, Shekhar. And Kajal, just a little thing. This gentleman is not a sadhu. Sorry. He, he is but a... What, you only called him sadhu. <laughs> sadhu. I called him sadhu. sadhu. Gee, that he, he's far from being a sadhu. He, <laughs> He's, he's as cool as they come as spiritual gurus. Well, you can so, make out the way he spoke that he's very and, cool, but I mean, he's... He, he, you called him sadhu, so I also called him sadhu. I called him sadguru. Oh, sadguru, okay. I mean, you know, sadhus, he can sort out many sadhus. So, <laughs> and he won't mind my saying all that. I get away with him with anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The period 2012 to 2030, India is on the path to destroy wealth in the magnitude of 4.6 trillion. NCDs need to be addressed. Sanitation is part, is one of the interventions that can have an effect. We're listing, we're listing in the report 12 over interventions. But I would like today that not only you talk about communicable diseases, but also NCDs as you um, run the panel, and uh, Gupta, with no further ado, I would like to call on to you, you are editorial advisor from, for India today, and uh, I will let you moderate the panel. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this was a wonderful introduction. I think you did half my job, so I, <laughs> I can cut straight to the panel. Thank you all for being here on an afternoon. Uh, I have a star-studded panel, and I'm not just referring to the star on my right, <laughs> uh, who everybody knows, she's Kajal, a well-known film star, although I have to make a personal disclosure, uh, since the age of 10, I've been in love with her mom. <laughs> I still am. Her mom was Tanuja, the great uh, actor of her times. Uh, Sanjeev Mehta is the CEO of Hindustan Levers. We have, we have two leaders of cleaning industry, cleaning and cleansing <laughs> industry. They compete in the marketplace, but the harder they compete, the better it is for us, which means they sell more cleansing uh, products. Uh, Sanjeev, who heads Hindustan Uni Unilever. Uh, Adi Godrej, uh, who many of you know, uh, regular presence at World Economic Forum, uh, runs Godrej Industries. And besides the fact that uh, this is today, um, I'm Ardo Berdart. I'm a, a senior director for uh, health and uh, healthcare industries at the World Economic Forum. 
very pleased to introduce in a few words this session. Um, so about um, sanitation. Uh, it's not uh, by coincidence that in most uh, uh, countries where healthcare is still at its infancy, actually ministers of health are also ministers of sanitation. If you think about uh, the magnitude of the issue globally, we're talking about 2.5 billion people on this planet that have no access to decent sanitation. 15% of the world population not having access to closed toilets. Uh, and that's a cost to the, to the society. And this is where we need to make investments. There is a study from the World Toilet Organization that demonstrates very precisely that from, for every one dollar invested, there is an eight dollar return in economic output and wealth from increased sanitation programs. We are releasing today at the World Economic Forum uh, our report on the economic burden of non-communicable diseases in India. This is a report we have uh, produced with the Harvard School of uh, Health Economics. And we are demonstrating in there that during... A population of about a crore, of which Singhalas were about 80, about 8 million? 75 percent, no, yeah. About, about 7.5 million. It raised no. an army at one point of 600,000? No, 200,000. A bit more than that. Yeah. A bit more than that. But suffered casualties, which were almost 1% of that strength of the army, over every year for many years, right? Uh, and all in internal conflict. So it's a country that could have had a lot of trouble with its social indicators. On the other hand, the country began investing in its social well-being very early on. So in so many years of traveling in uh, Sri Lanka, I started traveling in Sri Lanka in 1984. Uh, so it's 30 years. I have never seen any open defecation. I have never seen any of the filth that we routinely find in our country, in, in our cities and villages in any other part of the subcontinent. That's why we have Sarath Amunagama. He'll tell us what Sri Lanka did right and what the rest of us uh, did and not. Doing wrong. <laughs> uh, doing wrong. So, uh, uh, Kajal, I think uh, I'll be sort of, uh, uh, I'll get popular approval if I start with you. Uh, no, you won't, not from me. <laughs> you, are, you are not the ambassador who has to make sure that more children stay alive till the age of five. Yes. I'll, give, I'll give you a little, uh, little piece of statistics. Uh, India has among the poorest ratios numbers of children surviving till the age of five. And uh, it's a very interesting thing. I was reading The Economist, and I trust The Economist. Uh, it says that because of higher incidence of open defecation among Hindu populations, this mortality is higher among Hindu population than, than among Muslim population in India, even though Muslims are on an average much poorer than Hindus. Mm. Yeah. So you are teaching children to wash hands. Yeah. You are teaching children to keep sanitation, Definitely. so they survive, they, they pass this landmark. I'm teaching not only fire. children, I'm hoping to teach the parents as well to <laughs> wash their hands. I feel that um, we feel, uh, we feel as a team, as uh, this program Help a Child Reach Five, basically, we hope that by teaching children, we are, be, we are able to teach the parents as well and the entire family and uh, everybody around them. I think kids have this way of, um, you know, telling people around them about how something is very, very important to them and making them understand it in their own simple way that, oh, you know, this is really important. And they'll go up to their mom and say, mom, you have to wash your hands before lunch and you have to wash your hands after, uh, um, you know, after going to the loo or whatever. And that, that's really important. And our teacher taught to us in school and, you know, they're able to give this entire essay and fortunately they're children. So people just have to sit and listen to them. You can't even be impatient and say, just shut up over there. So, uh, so yeah, we've decided to use those little angels to do half our work for us. Um, also, as, um, as you pointed out, the mortality rate uh, worldwide is really, really big, and especially in our country, is it's 
of child mortality is in India. So I think, and mortality because the main two reasons are diarrhea and pneumonia, which sound, uh, you, you know, which sound so silly. You know, the homegrown FMCG giant. I can also tell you that in 2008, September, October, when everybody thought the world was coming to an end, after Lehman collapse, there was only one businessman, one Indian businessman, who said that wasn't true. In fact, business was booming. He was investing more and business was growing, and that was Adi Godrej. So I used to say that he should be appointed the national brand ambassador for wellness of some kind. Uh, so Adi, uh, thank you very much for being here. Sarath uh, Amaragama, uh, Senior Minister for Finance in Sri Lanka. Uh, he's a very experienced politician. But let me also tell you, uh, people, there are many uh, misconceptions in India and many mythologies. We now think that we are the richest country in the world, and uh, we sent uh, something to, the, uh, to Mars at 7 rupees a kilometer, as our prime minister keeps saying. And obviously, we've left everybody behind in the neighborhood. That's not quite true, uh, because I was watching the World, uh, uh, world Bank uh, ease of doing business ratings. And I found that you know, a lot of people were tweeting that India was ahead, say, of Pakistan. But on two or three very crucial indicators, Pakistan was still way ahead of India. But if you look at social indicators in the, re in the region, one country that's way ahead of all of us, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Uh, and that's despite the fact that Sri Lanka has had a history of really the most withering internal conflict. So just to give you an example of an idea of how bad that conflict was, because I used to cover that conflict as a war reporter for many years, and I've counted more dead bodies in Sri Lanka than in my country, although I've done a lot of that in my country as well. Uh,